Bhagavate Vasudevaya We are reading today from Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 6, Chapter 7, entitled Indra Offends Brihaspati, Sloka number 24. <coughs> Many crucial lessons are to be learned in this particular narration of Sri Shukadeva Goswami. One of which is that Vaishnava etiquette, it is not just a detail in Krishna consciousness culture. It is crucial, essential, and our spiritual lives depend on it. Oftentimes, devotees have a tendency to make wrong priorities. What are essential appear to be details that could either be accepted or rejected according to our convenience. And sometimes what is details is imagined to be something essential. We know that our sadhana, our bhajan, is crucial to our progress. Srila Rupa Goswami, he explains five principles of the 64 principles that are most essential for spiritual progress. <coughs> to associate with Vaishnavas. To chant the holy names of the Lord. To study Srimad Bhagavatam. To worship the deity, the Archamurti, and to live in a holy place like Brindavan, Navadweep, Jagannath Puri. And also worshiping Tulsi is sometimes within that category. So to chant the holy names is essential. Harinama, Harinama, Harinam eva kevalam kalo nasteva, nasteva, nasteva gatir anyuta. In this age of Kali, it is the most powerful means of deliverance. But if we do not follow proper Vaishnava etiquette, our chanting will have minimal effect. Lord Chaitanya said, simply chant the holy names and do not offend others, and Krishna will be there to save you. In fact, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, Krishna is not different than his name. Nam Nama Kari Bahuda Nija Saravashaktis, all of his powers are within his name. But then the Lord said, if a devotee is chanting the holy names, but offends Vaishnavas, Krishna is so displeased that Krishna through his name may destroy you out of mercy. Krishna's name is Krishna. He is a person. It is not something mechanical. We chant, but we must chant in a way that pleases the holy name. 
The seventh offense to the holy name is to commit sinful activities on the strength of chanting. If we think, let me chant, and then I can do anything sinful, and then I will rectify it by chanting again, if that is our mentality, you are offending God in his name. And the first of all offenses is to blaspheme devotees of the Lord. Why are these offenses? It is not just something mechanical. It must be understood in a very personalized way. These are offenses because they displease Krishna. Substantially. Thus, Lord Chaitanya taught how we should chant the holy name. Trinada pi sunichena taror iba sehishnana hamani na manade na kirtaniya sadahari. To be humble like a blade of grass, tolerant like the tree, ready to offer all respect to others and expect none in return. In this way, we could chant the holy name of the Lord constantly. Srimad Bhagavatam Shushushro Shuddhadana Sya Basudeva Kataruchi Syan Mahatsevaya Vipra Punya Tirtana Sevana Just by studying Srimad Bhagavatam we may not develop a taste within the heart. There are many scholars of the Bhagavad Purana who intellectually saturate themselves, but the message does not transform their heart. Why? Because Srimad Bhagavatam explains to get a taste for the Bhagavatam, you must observe proper etiquette. You must serve great souls. That service must come from the heart, with humility, with a desire to please, with care not to offend. Then Krishna is pleased with our disposition. And as we hear Srimad Bhagavatam or speak Srimad Bhagavatam, Krishna manifests himself within our hearts. and the worship of the deity. Without proper etiquette, we will not get the proper result. We may even get an opposite result. If we offend the deity, we will not make progress. The deity is Radharani and Krishna. They are there, standing before us. In order to do proper puja seva, we must understand what they want and what they don't want, personally. This is a universal principle. In the Christian religion, Jesus Christ said, if you're coming to bring an, uh, bring an offering to the altar, but you have some offensive dispute with someone else. Leave your offering, go back, resolve that dispute, and then come and offer to the deity. And Kanishta Adhikari, according to Srimad Bhagavatam, is the lowest platform, one who worships the deity, but does not offer honor, respect, and service to the devotees. That is devotional service, but it is on a lower platform. Because Krishna says, Mat Bhakta Puja Vyadika, worship of my devotee is what pleases me the most. If we offend the devotees, the Vaishnavas, then do you think Krishna would like to see us when we come to worship him on the altar? 
Not at all. So worship of the deity is one of the five most important principles of bhakti, according to our Gaudiya Vaishnava system. But it is crucial, it is essential to have proper etiquette in dealings with others for the deity to be pleased. And living in the holy dham of Braj Bhumi, there are nam aparads, there are dham aparads. It is said that it is the holy man that revealed the holy dham. Because you cannot see Vrindavan with material eyes. Premanjana Churita Bhakti Velochanena. Krishna is divine, he is transcendental, and similarly his abode. The holy dham is transcendental. It cannot be approached through our mundane senses. The holy dham is non different than Radha Gopinath. The holy dham reveals herself according to how we please her. Vrindavaneshwari, Radharani is the queen of Vrindavan. If she is pleased, she reveals Vrindavan to us. It is not a matter of buying a ticket and going there and going to shop in Loi Bazaar. Then we're only seeing the superficial external covering of the Holy Dham, which is also holy and will also sanctify us. But if we actually want to see as it is, to the extent and to the degree that Srimati Radharani is pleased, she will reveal the Holy Dham to us. And how do we please Sri Radha? It is not according to our imagination. We must understand from the spiritual masters, from the sadhus, from the shastras. And if we follow those principles carefully, then only will we understand what is Vrindavan. I remember in 1971, some devotees had an argument with, actually it happened a little later, some devotees had an argument with some Brijabasi merchants. By material standards, that merchant was trying to cheat the devotee. So they were bargaining, and then they started shouting, and then they started pushing. When Srila Prabhupada found out about that, he told the devotee, leave Vrindavan, go somewhere else. You cannot be here and offend the Brijabhasis. Even if they try to cheat you, you cannot offend them like this. There's a certain etiquette to not be cheated and be respectful. <laughs> Otherwise, it's very dangerous. So why Prabhupada said, go out of Vrindavan unless you know how to behave within. So in this way, Vaishnava etiquette is essential. And here in the Srimad Bhagavatam, which is the topmost scripture, the Amalam Puranam, teaching the highest understanding of the Absolute Truth, culminates in Krishna's Brajlila, is explaining so emphatically through this example today. Indra is a devotee. He's residing in the Swarga Loka, and he has such an important service to the Lord. He is the king of the Devatas. 
and for administrative kings to do their service properly, they need power. They're supposed to be worshipped and honored with opulences. We find every king like that, even very humble kings, Yudhisthira Maharaj. He was happy living in the forest, but when he was given the king by Krishna, he sat on the throne with all the royal opulences of a king. But that is an earthly king. Indra's powers are beyond human conception. He is the king of the Devatas. His subjects are people like Vayu and Agni and Surya. They are reporting to him. Hare Krishna, very powerful. And what magnificent wealth he has. Tremendous intellect, physical beauty, fame, wealth, strength, beauty, fame, knowledge. He had all of these opulences beyond human comprehension. But the sixth one, renunciation. <laughs> there was some shortcoming there. Because the principle of renunciation is really based on the principle of humility. Actual renunciation doesn't simply mean giving up our wealth and our position. Akinshana gocharam. Renunciation means giving up the false sense of proprietorship. To know that everything is the property of Krishna. I am nothing. My wealth, my knowledge, my abilities, my very life, everything is the property of Krishna. If we understand this principle, there is no possibility of becoming proud. Janasya moho yamaham The very root of material bondage in these two misconceptions, I and mine. I am this body. In this case, I am the king of heaven. I am Indra. I am the lord of all I survey. And this kingdom and all of the people within the kingdom are mine. It's quite irresistible. Whether we're just sleeping in the streets of Bombay or we're the king of heaven, Maya will come to delude you with this misconceptions of I and mine. So Indra, on this particular day, is sitting in his assembly on a throne with his beautiful wife, Sachi, beside him. And all the varieties of devatas and even great sages and rishis are worshipping him. This was part of the culture, to worship the king. Gandharvas were singing from him. Apsaras were dancing from him. Brahmins were chanting Vedic mantras for him. There was a canopy as bright as the moon over his head. Servants were not just ordinary servants, but very exalted personalities were fanning him with the chamara. Everything in that assembly was focused exclusively on Indra. <coughs> At that time, Brihaspati came in not in a entourage, but just in a very simple, unassuming way, Brihaspati just walked in, as he would walk in almost every day. 
It was a common thing. But Indra, due to false pride, he was so absorbed in receiving worship, so intoxicated by his position and his power and his wealth, that he did not stand up to offer respects to his guru. He did not even perform the simplest etiquette of folding his palms or offering a place to sit. He considered, it is my duty as king to accept this worship. So he carried on. Now, Brihaspati is very intelligent. He has spiritual vision. He's a knower of Brahman. He understood the mentality of Indra. Due to his false pride, he is not offering honor to a Brahman, his guru, and a self-realized soul. Brihaspati knew that Indra was intoxicated by pride and therefore he would have to be punished by God. Because Krishna says, Konte yaprati jani hi name bhakta pranashyati. I protect my devotees. Krishna gives us so many instructions to protect us. Krishna gives us so many warnings to protect us. But if we neglect them and we continue to act inappropriately, then out of Krishna's mercy, he may have to punish us. It may begin with a little slap and then a stronger slap and a stronger slap. And if those things don't work, as difficult as it may seem and as inconceivable, he may have to cast us down to the bottom of human indecency. He may take away everything we've given our life for in our spiritual search. That may be what we need to become humble. And for Krishna, it's worth it to make us pure devotees. Out of mercy, Krishna withdrew his powers from Indra because he displeased his spiritual master. So Brihaspati did not say a word to anyone. He just left to go home. Now because Indra is a devotee, he was very intelligent. He understood, I just made a big mistake. Everything I've accomplished in my life is on the verge of ruination because of this one offense. I must make up a... And Indra spoke to the assembly. He had that much humility that I have done something so mad. I ignored the presence of a superior personality. And he spoke to all the demigods and he spoke to all the world through the Srimad Bhagavatam. It's not worth having these material opulences if it's going to cause our fall down. Better we don't have any opulences. Kunti Devi, she tells in this way, if we want to feelingly cry out the holy name of the Lord, we cannot be attached, nor can we be pursuing these material opulences. 
high birth, wealth, knowledge, beauty, because they intoxicate us with pride. Even if you are a, a person who is spiritually very recognized and honored, Ramaharshan Sutta was such a person. He was honored by great sages and rishis. He was different than Indra in the sense that Indra was a Kshatriya, demigod, who was living in royalty and puffed up by his power, fame, beauty, and strength and wealth. Ramaharshan Sutta was a Brahman, a disciple of Vyastev, who thoroughly knew the Shastras and who lived a very, very simple life. Brahmins in those days did not have material possessions. But he did the same thing. When Sri Baladev came to Naima Sharanya, Ramaharshan Sutta just went on speaking. That's all. Is that such an offense? He just went on speaking. He didn't think it was necessary for himself to offer respect to a superior personality. So Balaramji, out of mercy to Ramaharshan Sutta and to show the whole world the importance of Vaishnava etiquette, he condemned Ramaharshan Sutta. What is the use of all your knowledge of the Vedas? What is the use of your being a disciple of Yaste? What is the use of your being such a great orator and such a powerful, famous Brahman? If it makes you proud. And with a piece of grass, he ended Ramaharshan's life. Vaishnava etiquette is not a detail. It is crucial. We read it again and again in the Holy Scriptures. And in the case of Indra, he ignored offering proper respect for two reasons. One is because of his pride. Two, because he had this sense of familiarity. Srila Prabhupada and the Acharyas explain that Brigo, um, Brihaspati would regularly come to visit Indra and the Devatas, almost on a daily basis. It is said familiarity breeds contempt. We take things for granted if they are too much available to us. And that is what Indra did. Here is a very, very important puja going on to him. And Brihaspati, he comes all the time. So he just carried on in what he considered his service. It was his service to be honored by the demigods. He just was performing his service. But then he realized, it's too late. Rehaspati did not curse Indra. He just knew that Krishna was about to teach him a good lesson, so he left. Now, Rehaspati was not angry at Indra because he offended him. Rehaspati was displeased with Indra because he knew he was creating his own ruination due to his ahankar, his ego. So he left. Now, so subtle. The demigods do not need internet. <laughs> Immediately, the Asuras understood Indra has offended his guru. Therefore, he's going to be in a piteous, weak condition. 
and because of his offense, all the demigods will lose their powers. So what did the demons do? They worshipped Shukracharya, their guru. And they got great powers. And immediately they attacked. And the devatas, their arms and their legs and their heads and their bodies were being pierced by sharp arrows and, and bludgeoned by hard clubs. They were helpless, defeated. All they could do is run away. They ran to Lord Brahma, begging him for help. And here we find Lord Brahma chastising them for being so ignorant. Oh, best of the demigods, Unfortunately, because of madness resulting from your material opulence, you failed to receive Brihaspati properly when he came to your assembly. Because he is aware of the Supreme Brahman and fully in control of his senses, he is the best of the Brahmans. Therefore, it is very astonishing that you have acted impudently toward him. Now, if he would have stood up and said, Brihaspati, twenty years ago you had some problem with somebody else, that would have been more of an offense. Or Brihaspati, what? he didn't insult him. He didn't do anything wrong to him. He just didn't stand up to offer respect. And that only lasted for a minute or two. Then he was willing to do it. But in that minute or two, he neglected a great personality. Vaishnava etiquette is something very serious. And therefore, the Supreme Lord as well as his devotees, teach us this principle. Amani ma manadena, to offer respect to others. Srila Prabhupada herein quotes that Krishna, he is full of all six opulences. Whatever Indra or anyone else has, it's only by the grace of Krishna. He's the Supreme Lord He's Jagatpate, the Lord of the universe. And when he was in his palace in Dwarka, when Narada Muni came into the assembly, Krishna came down off of his throne to offer all respect, honor, and worship to Narada Muni. Narada Muni knows that he's the Supreme Lord, I'm only his devotee. But still, Prabhupada says, because he was a brahmachari, and a brahman, and a realized sage, Krishna wanted to show the world by his example. In Bhagavad Gita, Krishna tells, if I do not set the proper example by my standards, then the whole world would be ruined because they will not know. Similarly, Sudama Vibra, he wasn't an inter, an inter universal celebrated sage like Narada Rishi. Sudama Vibra was just an unknown Brahman. Just living in Purbandar, outside of Dwarka. Absolutely poverty stricken from a material sense. Can you imagine the best thing that he could bring to Krishna was a little cloth bag of chipped rice. That's the best he could get. And yet when he came into Krishna's palace, Lord Krishna stood up 
put him on his own bed, washed his feet. And Sudama Brahman, he offered that beautiful prayer. Who am I? Just a very fallen, poor-hearted Brahman. And who are you, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the God of all gods, the husband of Lakshmi? And yet you are honoring me. Why? Krishna is making a very powerful statement of how crucial it is to be respectful to others. And we have Sri Ramchandra. Although he was the Lord of, of everything, how he respected the Brahmins, the sages, and his gurus. He would massage the feet of Vishramitra Muni. He would not eat or sleep until he received the permission of Vishramitra Muni when they were traveling in the forest together. Ramchandra was offering humble questions before his guru. Obviously, Ram knows more than Vishramitra Muni. Vedaishta Sarvera Hameva Vedyo. He is the cause of the Vedas. He's the source of the Vedas. He's the knower of the Vedas. And he, all the Vedas are to know him. And yet he's asking Vishramitra Muni, tell me, answer, tell me about what the Vedas say about the Ganga. The Ganga is coming from his feet. He knows. But he's, in, but he's inquiring from Vishramitra, please explain to me the glories of the Ganga. Why? To show the world what it means to actually honor a superior personality. Superior in this sense, in the sense of etiquette, of social position. And in Mithila, Lord Shankar's bow was on that altar. And all the royalty of Mithila, including Sita herself, were assembled to see if Sri Ramchandra could be the one to lift that bow and string it. Ram's heart was palpitating with anticipation to be reunited with his eternal beloved consort, Janaki. And Sita Devi, her heart was over flooding with anticipation to be reunited with her Lord, Sri Ram. But still, Lord Ramchandra first asked permission from Vishramitra Muni and took his blessings before going to lift the ball to show the world Vaishnava etiquette and its importance. If the Lord observes it, what is our position? <coughs> Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, how he honored his spiritual master. He was Nimai Pandit, the greatest number one top scholar in all of creation. And yet, when Ishwarapuri asked him, please edit my book, Krishna Lilamrita, Nimai Pandit said, how can I edit your words? You are a great devotee. Even if your words are wrong, they're better than being right. The Bhagavatam explains, Persons who are actually highly advanced, they relish hearing the glories of the Lord, even if not composed properly, even if not pronounced properly, even if there may be some apparent flaws, they will never hesitate to hear from such persons. 
because they're speaking with devotion. So Nimai Pandit said, I cannot, you are a great devotee. Whatever you say is with love for Krishna, therefore it is perfect. If there's a mis only a fool who is ignorant will think that there could be a mistake in what you're speaking. And later on, when Lord Chaitanya took initiation from Ishwara Puri, he offered him such respect. He brought him to his house first and, and, and served him prasad and sat at his feet and heard Krishna Katha from him. And later on he went to Gaya and fell at his feet and begged for initiation and served him in such a menial way. And not only to his guru, but to all senior personalities. Lord Chaitanya, although he is Radha and Krishna, Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikriti Ladini Shakti Rasma, Krishna and Radha are two, but they have appeared in one form as Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. Lord Chaitanya is Krishna with the sentiments of the Mahabhava of Sri Radharani and with her beautiful golden complexion. He's the supreme. Yet Lord Chaitanya wanted to teach the world by his example. He came as an acharya. And how he honored senior people. Kesh of Kashmiri, he was a Brahman. He was a gifted disciple of Saraswati. But he was proud. But still, Lord Chaitanya honored his position. Lord Chaitanya defeated him in such a miraculous way that he never, ever, ever in the slightest way disrespected him. And even when the students of Lord Chaitanya laughed at Keshav Kashmiri, seeing him defeated so soundly, Lord Chaitanya stopped them. Do not laugh. Honor him. Respect him. And Keshav Kashmiri, later he came to Lord Chaitanya and said, I could understand you're the Supreme Personality of Godhead, not only because Saraswati appeared to me and chastised me and revealed your identity, but who else but the Supreme Lord could defeat such a proud person as me without disrespecting me? Hare Krishna. And how Lord Chaitanya honored all of his gurus, all of the senior Vaishnavas. He treated Paramananda Puri as his own guru. Brahmananda Bharati, Brahmananda Puri, Nityananda Prabhu and how he honored Adwaita Prabhu. Adwaita Prabhu was very upset about this. He had to go to extremes of preaching Mayavad philosophy publicly, profusely. That was the extent he had to, display, to, to get Lord Chaitanya to give up his respectful demeanor toward him. And then it was only for a minute or two So Lord Chaitanya, he really showed Vaishnava etiquette. And one of the most classic examples is Ramachandra Puri.